today we will discuss about literature we will see the literature aspects right good evening students welcome back to plutus is right so <coughs> uh, as part of our uh, art and culture lectures today we will discuss about literature we will see the literature aspects right so previously we have st uh, studied about uh, painting some aspects related to painting and the schools of art like uh, mathura school of art gandhara school of art and amravati school of art and before that we have studied about the temple architecture so in the sequence only today we are going to study about the literature but however in this uh, lecture literature i am not going to discuss about the individual writers and their books mostly i am uh, taking the path of conceptual path i am taking the path of concept so broadly i am going to uh, discuss the literature what are various types of literature how many parts we can divide the literature uh, especially uh, in the ancient india in that way we are going to approach right so uh, majorly i am also uh, going to focus the angle that how literature literature he is uh, helping as a source of history source of history so i am going to discuss the literature from that perspective so because of we are taking this approach because the because of that reason uh, broadly you will be missing the specific writers and their uh, specific books related to them or associated with them so when you study dynasty by dynasty like the mughal dynasty uh, delhi sultanate and uh, if you see the ancient india if you see the guptans mauryans etc then you will know about the specific names about the scientists or the authors or the writers and their specific books so here we are not taking that approach we are uh, taking a holistic approach we are seeing literature as a source of history so because of this uh, mostly you will this the uh, miss the authors and the books however you will be having sufficient information to answer most of the questions so it is not sure that always the uh, individual authors and their books will be asked there may be a question on the conceptual aspects related to uh, literature also for example vedas vedangas upanishads etc itihasas etc uh, or there may be a question on jain literature buddhist literature also so that the in that way also you will be benefited and you will be in a good position to answer the questions right so uh, before going into detailed discussion i have categorized the sources of literature into uh, broadly five categories that is first one is religious literature first one is religious literature second one is uh, secular literature secular literature and third one is scientific literature scientific literature fourth one is sangam literature so i am going to separately discuss sangam literature and various aspects related to sangam literature this has happened between 3rd century BT, bc to 3rd uh, century ad so a vast volume of sangam literature has been created and lastly in the fifth part we are going to see the accounts of the travelers so there are there are some famous travelers who have visited india at different points of time and they have left a vast amount of information and that is working as a very good source of in a uh, source of information to construct or reconstruct the history so the travelers like megasthenes fahian huyen sang etc etc there are many uh, travelers are there we we are going to see those accounts their accounts also so broadly we can divide into these many categories so first we will see the religious literature uh, first we will see the religious literature or religious texts so religion when we take it will be we can broadly divide it into three categories especially in the ancient period first one is hindu literature 
लिटरेचर रिलेटेड टू हिंदुइजम नेक्स्ट लिटरेचर लिटरेचर रिलेटेड टू बुद्धिज्म नेक्स्ट जैन जैन लिटरेचर आल्सो इज देयर सो फर्दर देर इज अ सब कैटेगराइजेशन कॉल्ड हिंदू लिटरेचर इट कैन बी क्लासिफाइड इन टू श्रुति एंड स्मृति लिटरेचर स्मृति लिटरेचर एंड श्रुति लिटरेचर बुद्धिस्ट एंड जैन लिटरेचर ब्रॉडली कैन बी बुद्धिस्ट लिटरेचर कैन बी डिवाइडेड इन टू कैनोनिकल लिटरेचर एंड नॉन कैनोनिकल लिटरेचर कैनोनिकल इज समथिंग रिलेटेड टू रूल्स एंड रेगुलेशन and uh, what are the uh, rules and regulations that have to be followed by the buddhist monks etc so that type of literature is known as canonical literature and something related to biographies and uh, life of buddha etc these kind of literature is known as non canonical literature uh, jain also there are main uh, major two schools that is uh, svetambara and digambara and the literature also can be divided and For on that lines, this is the broader division of again, uh, again the broader division of religious literature. So first we will uh, go through the Hindu literature or literature that is related to Hinduism. Then we will see the other two subclasses. So uh, Hindu literature, it can be further divided into Sriti and Smriti. The actual or we can say literal meaning of uh, Sriti is. what is heard that is known as shruti so shruti takes whatever it is there majorly the vedas four vedas they are considered part of the shruti literature so they are considered as divine origin i mean the vedas are considered as they are given by god so they are heard from the god and that's why they are called as shruti literature they are considered as divine right so four vedas the rigveda samaveda yajurveda yadurveda yajurveda uh, and atharva veda those are the uh, they considered as the shruti literature so broadly they can be put in the time period of 1500 to 500 bc so you know first uh, 1500 to 1000 years it is the period of rigveda it is the period of rigveda and uh, the next 500 years 1000 to 500 BC it is later vedic period so in that in that time period the other three vedas samaveda atharva veda and yajur veda they are composed right so these uh, these texts uh, shruti literature it is considered as most sacred and authoritative text in the hinduism uh, they are the foundation of all hindu philo- philosophies and practices so some historians they will uh, put the upanishads upanishad uh, upanishads also in this uh, shruti literature however it is better to consider them in the smriti literature only right so examples are four vedas right this is shruti literature next what is meant by smriti the literal meaning of smriti smriti is what is remembered so you know very well in the ancient ancient time there is no concept of writing so all the text have composed orally only and they used to be remembered orally and they have been transferred or transferred to the next generations through oral orally only orally only so uh, so the smriti uh, because of that reason also the literature whatever it is there that is uh, literally called as uh what is remembered so it is believed that it is these books are composed by human scholars and the sages over a long period of time approximately between 200 bc to 680 see collections if you see dharma shastras so there are many dharma shastras there dharma shastras are there so they generally uh, deal with the codes dealing with the law social order etc example is manus manusmriti narada smriti is there manusmriti is there so those are the examples epics are there ramayana and mahabharata puranas are there so total in total 18 puranas are there we will study about them upanishads there are uh, almost 108 108 upanishads are there it is being told like that 
so all these things are part of the uh, smriti literature <coughs> they provide insights into insights into social norms legal practices and moral codes in ancient india right right so if you see their authority they are considered secondary to the shruti literature that is vedas right <coughs> so this is about smriti literature now we will see about the vedas so four vedas are there you know rigveda so all the vedas at the end of the day they have mantras they are uh, also known as hymns uh, they are shlokas so they are offerings or prayers to the gods various gods all the vedas they have prayers to the gods especially the rigveda prayers to the gods so what are there uh, they pray to the gods that they will be protected the vedic people pray to the gods that they will be protected from the natural disasters like rains etc etc and they prayed for more children they prayed for more cows etc so basically there are prayers in the vedas especially in the rigveda next samaveda so it is something related to music samaveda is nothing but music so the ved i mean the hymns that are there in the rigveda how to uh, tune them how to tune them how to sing them during the rituals that is explained in the samaveda right so it is something uh, many people they that the source for the music is samaveda only now also people say that right so here the hymns are primarily drawn from rigveda only but they are arranged in chanted in a specific wave uh, that is the duty or that is there in the samaveda next is yajurveda so this is something related to yagnas how the yagnas have to be performed uh, this is a collection of sacrificial formulas and mantras uh, it is the most complex of the four vedas and is divided into two main uh, two main divisions that is shukla yajurveda that is white yajurveda and krishna yajurveda that is black yajurveda so the sulva sutra a part of yajurveda is also there it will talk about the designs in what ways altars have to be uh, built uh, in that the yagnas will be performed so that is there in the uh, yajurveda <coughs> next is atharva veda so atharva veda has some spells and uh, it uh, it is a, a collection of spells and charms used for healing so whenever people fell ill the mantras that are there in the atharva veda so they will be chanted uh, they will be chanted in the belief that people will be cured cured so so uh, it is the most di- distinct of all the four vedas it as it focuses more on magic and the practical af- applications than the praise for the gods so this is about the four vedas right so apart from this one you will also know about the other things that is the vedangas vedangas literally meaning the limbs of the vedas so the lim- limbs of the vedas are very important without which we cannot understand the vedas so there are six vedangas they are shiksha that is something related with the phonetics i mean how the words uh, during the uh, prayers or during the yagas how the words have to be properly uttered so this shiksha will give that information so it deals with the proper pronunciation and the recitation of vedic text so actual or proper pronunci- pronunciation is considered very very important during the performance of the uh, yagas or yagnas next is vyakarana grammar so you know very well vyakarana is very very important for a language vyakarana gives rules and regulations for a language next is nirukta that is etymology etymology you know very well it uh, traces the origin of the words how the words have emerged so that is nirukta so it helps understand the meaning and obscure words and phrases found in the vedas next is chanda chanda you know matrix so it is the it gives beauty to the language that is matrix so this discipline focuses on the meter or matrix and the rhythm of the vedic 
shlokas are hymns right so many hymns were uh, composed in specific meters for uh, recitation during ritu- rituals and the chanda ensured their proper performance next is kalpa that is ritual so it is a vast complex vedanga dealing with the proper conduct of vedic rituals and the sacrifices so whatever the uh, performance of yagas is there or performance of sacrifices is there they should be performed in a proper way so that is that is uh, those things are mentioned in kalpa it is known as ritual next then the last one is uh, jyotisha it is also known as astronomy so it is concerned with the movements of celestial bodies and their role in determining the auspicious timing for performing vedic uh, rituals or sacrifices so this is about the vedangas right right so this is about uh, the vedas and their vedanga vedas we can we can uh, put in the smriti literature so from epics nava this con- comes under smriti literature smriti literature right so here epics are there very important two important epics ramayana and mahabharata so in belief it is uh, said that ramayana happened much more thousands of years before mahabharata uh, right <coughs> dwapar uh, in the yuga of dwapar dwapar yuga ramayana has occurred and in treta yuga uh, krishna uh, krishna was there at that time mahabharata has occurred and presently we are in kali yuga right so that is the time period so people's belief is that ramayana happened much more be- before the uh, mahabharata but if you see the original text of ramayana and mahabharata the compose the things that are explained in the books or in these epics like uh, ramayana the geographical pe- uh, geographical features the people's conditions if you see mahabharata is composed much more before than ramayana and if you see the size also Ram- mahabharata is very vast when compared to uh, uh, ramayana also so try to have these things clearly so broadly we can put mahabharata in the time period of uh, 14th century ad bc to 40th 4th century sorry 4th century bc to 4th century ad so in that pa- time period we can put mahabharata ramayana we can put 5th century between 5th century to 3rd century bc right so this is about ramayana and mahabharata most of the things you know very well but uh, try to know about these factual things uh, if you see the number of shlokas the mahabharata has lot many shlokas many times multiple times more shlokas than the ramayana so all the things are not factual that are mentioned in the ramayana and mahabharata so because of that only they are called as epics epics so the imaginary things imagined by the authors have been put in there right so that is about the ramayana and mahabharata next uh, next important uh, we can say uh, uh, i mean the composition of books is there that is known as puranas so puranas are also mostly imaginary text only there is uh, i mean very very least uh, historic uh, importance to them, uh, them if we see historically however they played an important role whenever there is a lack of information available with with the, in the history so whenever there is lack of information lack of other source the puranas have helped in establishing the chronology chronology of various dynasties where other information is lacking so in that way the puranas have historical significance so in total there are uh, people call that there are 18 puranas so they are also known as astadasha puranas right <coughs> they are known for their intricate narratives symbolism and diverse subject matter so each purana and before that we will see uh, the there are mostly composed in sanskrit and other indian languages so they believe to be compilations of ancient lore passed down through oral traditions uh, centuries before being written down so you know very well most of the text ancient texts they were being passed through orally uh, from one generation to another generation only during the time of guptans they have most of them have been put to writing 
राइट द सेम थिंग हैपन विद पुराना ऑल्सो राइट सो एस्टिमेट एस्टिमेशन सजेस्ट दैट देर कंपोजिशन माइट हैव अकर्ड बिटवीन थ्री हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी बी सी टू फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड एटी एट डी राइट सो ट्रेडिशनली इट इज बिलीव दैट देर आर एटीन पुराना एटीन पुराना आर देर दट इज दट नंबर इज अष्टादश पुराना दो देर आर वेरिएशन एंड अडिशनल टेक्स्ट uh additional texts are there which also consider upanishads also as puranas however some of the important puranas are vishnu purana shiva purana bhagavata purana matsya purana linga purana right so these kind of puranas are there adi purana is there adi purana is also there it is considered as the foremost purana right so this is these are some of the examples of puranas apart from that there are five characteristic features for every purana when th- those five it is not compulsory that each and every purana has shall have these five characteristic features if a particular purana has all these five characteristic features features that is known as adarsha purana which means ideal purana so in some puranas one of the one or uh, more of these characteristic features are missing so no problem with that however if a purana has all these five characteristic features that purana is known as adarsha purana or ideal purana so the five puranas are uh, sorry five characteristic features are right so primary creation that is known as uh, sarga sarga and pratisarga sarga and pratisarga which means creation and destruction so first characteristic feature is there is there will be origin of the universe it will there will be origin of the universe in that purana and at the end there will be destruction of that origin destruction of the universe will also be there in that purana that is the first characteristic feature next is srishti will be there i mean creation of the human uh, beings will be there that is known as secondary creation secondary creation will be there that is second characteristic feature right next feature there will be genealogy of gods will be explained the genealogy or lineology of the uh, <coughs> gods will be explained that is known as vamsha so not only gods the patriarchs and the kings all the genealogy of these uh, uh, ex- uh, these uh various we can say various geneal- genealogies genealogies will be explained that is known as vamsha so third characteristic feature is vamsha so i was mentioning the puranas also somehow they work as the source of history so uh, through this genealogy only only we will come to know about the chronology of kings right next is uh re- reigns of manus will be there that is manvantara will be there so in every yuga the manu rulings will be there manu will be ruling various manus will be ruling that is known as manvantara and the final characteristic feature is uh, history of solar and the lunar dynasties will be there that is the history of surya vamsha surya vamshas and chandra vamshis so that description will be there so these are the uh, five characteristics of features of puranas so whenever a purana has all these things that is known as ideal purana right so some of the other matters that are there in the puranas are cosmolo- cosmological theories geography will be there hindu philosophy and rituals are there temple rituals are there myths and legends about the gods goddesses and historical phys- figures is also there so this is the story about the puranas next we have upanishads upanishads also very very important from the point of view of uh, ancient indian uh, history so mainly the concept of vedanta you know the philosoph- philosophical aspect vedanta the indian philosophy that is known as vedanta so the entire vedanta comes from the upanishads so some people believe that there are in total 108 upanishads right 108 upanishads are there some other also keep this number as 
హండ్రెడ్ సో వెన్ ఎవర్ ఇన్ ది ఏన్షియంట్ ఇండియన్ ట్రెడిషన్ హండ్రెడ్ మీన్స్ ది షూ ది యూస్ టు నాట్ టు స్టాప్ అట్ హండ్రెడ్ ది యూస్ టు గో టు వన్ జీరో ఎయిట్ సో ఇఫ్ యూ కన్సిడర్ ద శతకాస్ ఆల్సో మెనీ శతకాస్ హ్యావ్ బిన్ రిటర్న్ ఇన్ ది ఇండియన్ లాంగ్వేజెస్ మెనీ ఇండియన్ లాంగ్వేజెస్ సో శతకా మీన్స్ ది యూస్ టు ది యూస్ టు హ్యావ్ హండ్రెడ్ వన్ నాట్ సారీ నాట్ హండ్రెడ్ బట్ వన్ నాట్ ఎయిట్ పోయమ్స్ సో దిస్ నెంబర్ ఇన్ ఇండియన్ ఫిలాసఫీ వన్ జీరో ఎయిట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ కన్సిడర్డ్ యాజ్ ఆస్పిసియస్ సో ది పోయట్స్ హ్యావ్ టు హ్యావ్ వన్ జీరో ఎయిట్ పోయమ్స్ ఇన్ ఏ శతక సో సిమిలర్లీ ఉపనిషత్స్ ఆల్సో పీపుల్ బిలీవ్ దట్ దెర్ ఆర్ హండ్రెడ్ ఉపనిషత్స్ బట్ హండ్రెడ్ మీన్స్ ద నంబర్ ఈజ్ నాట్ ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ హండ్రెడ్ బట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ వన్ జీరో ఎయిట్ రైట్ సో ఇట్ ఈస్ బిలీవ్ దట్ ద ఉపనిషత్స్ హ్యావ్ బీన్ కంపోజ్ బిట్వీన్ సెవెన్ హండ్రెడ్ బిసి టు త్రీ హండ్రెడ్ అండ్ బిసి రైట్ so if we see the key themes that are there in the upanishads uh, upanishads you know some examples are manduk manduk upanishad uh, <coughs> etc there are many upanishads are there we will see the examples for the upanishads also some of the names of the upanishads so some of the key themes are atman that is self and brahman that is ultimate reality we can also call it as atman and paramatman that concept will also be there next is moksha concept of moksha will be there moksha is what is moksha it is the liberation from the cycle of birth and death that is known as cycle of rebirth that is also known as samsara so there is a cycle of birth and death so a human being is caught in this cycle so uh, to be liberated from this cycle of birth and rebirth or birth and death a person has to attain moksha so moksha once moksha is attained a person is freed from this cycle so that concept is also there how moksha can be attained moksha can be attained through attainment of knowledge that is attainment of gnana or devotion or through devotion that is bhakti or action performed without attachment or outcomes that is karma yoga so through this various means one can attain moksha next car, uh, concept is karma and dharma these concepts are also there and they, these are also very central to uh, indian philosophy that is karma means the law of cause and effect and uh, dharma that is righteous duty so these things are also defined or discussed in the upanishads right so so there are primarily we will see 10 to 13 uh, there are important upanishads uh, they are including the isa kena katha munduka and mandyuka upanishad is uh, upanishad is also there prasna uh, mandukya taitareya aitareya sandogya <coughs> brihadaranyaka these are the most studied and most important upanishads right so this is some information about the upanishads so uh, you know these are the upanishads are the basis of the philosophy indian philosophy that is known as vedanta so remember this aspect so this is about upanishads so this is about indian uh, religious literature we have seen smriti and uh, shruti and smriti literature and uh, smriti in shruti vedas and vedangas and in smriti we have seen puranas itihasas and upanishads all these things we have seen now uh, we we will see the buddhist literature so buddhist literature it can uh, encompasses a vast collection of texts uh, that originated in india and uh, spread to asia after some time right so these books texts have the uh, as the foundation for buddhist teachings and practices offerings insight offering insights into the life of the buddha his philosophy and the path to enlightenment right so uh, actually uh, the first buddhist council that held about 3 months after the death of buddha that played a crucial role in preserving the te- teachings of buddha so by that time in the that council first buddhist buddhist council it has been decided that all the teachings uh, teachings of buddha have to be put into writing right 
so the actual writing uh, actual writing down of the pali canon so mostly earlier the buddhist literature was composed in pali language later later they have shifted to uh, the sanskrit either sanskrit or prakrit but all the earlier text prakrit but all the earlier texts they are in this one only pali language only because pali has considered to be the was considered to be the language of the masses so buddha used pali language increasingly it is believed that sanskrit is the language of the elites so he preferred pali language over sanskrit language however the because of the tradition of mahayana buddhism etc so the again the focus has shifted some somewhere in between shifted to sanskrit and prakrit only right so the books have been put into writing in the pali language uh, somewhere in sri lanka right <coughs> so major categories are uh, uh, if you see uh, tripitakas are there so tripitakas are the foundation of the buddhist philosophy right so these are the foundational collection of theravada buddhism so <coughs> so these are believed to be the closest representation of the buddhist teachings because based on these books many commentaries have come many buddhist scholars later sta- have started interpreting interpreting the teachings of buddha so uh, many commentaries have come so because of that reason the uh, tripitakas they have considered as the major we can say close to the teachings of buddha so there are tripitakas there are three so in tripitakas there are three important books that is first one is vinaya pitaka it is also known as uh, the basket of uh, discipline next is sutta pitaka it is also known as the ba- basket of uh discourses so uh it uh, it has wide range of topics like meditation ethics karma and rebirth next is abhidhamma pitaka it is the uh, basket of higher doctrines it has the concepts like uh, consciousness mental states and the nature of reality so other important texts are also there like uh, mahayana sutra sar der tantra sar der commentaries like earlier earlier i have told there are many commentaries also next uh, this is about the buddhist literature apart from that many other texts also uh, uh, text also there uh, certain texts from sri lanka like uh, deepavamsa deepavamsa mahavamsa so these are kind of secular texts only within the buddhist literature they will give evidence about the buddha and his teachings also they throw light on the mauryan empire the mauryan and later Ma- Ma- about the later mauryan rulings these texts will throw a light deepavamsa mahavamsa many other Bud- buddhist books are there right so apart uh, after that so jain literature is also there so jain literature majorly it talks about the uh, the teachings of the uh, <coughs> so majorly we can divide the jainist uh, jain literature into two main sects that is uh, digambara sect uh, sect and uh, swetambara sect right so majorly they contain the teachings of the tirthankaras tirthankaras the 18 tirthankaras you know very well there are 18 tirthankaras last being the vartamana mahavira who oh, vartamana mahavira so broadly the jain literature has the teachings of all the tirthankaras broadly we can divide it into three canons uh, th- those are swetambara canon it is considered as the most complete collection consisting of 45 agamas uh, again canonical text canonical text means they have the t- i mean rules and regulations that have to be followed by the buddhist uh, jain monks that is the canonical literature right so they are believed to be the direct teachings of the tirthankaras digambara canon is there it is uh, contains the four 14 core texts and emphasizes the teachings of the last tirthankara that is mahavira right 
so if you see the books are distinctive features the books emphasize on the non violence that is ahimsa and they focus also focus on karma and liberation so you remember one thing not only the hinduism but the jainism jainism also uh, speaks about the philosophy of karma and liberation right text if you see so agamas are there uh, they are, they are the agamas are the svetambara canon they are these are 45 core text and cover various topics like cosmology ethics metaphysics etc next there are uh, tatvarda sutra it is being composed between 1st and 2nd century ad uh, right it is a core digambara text attributed to umas umaswati offering a conscious view of jain philosophy next there is yoga shastra it is composed between 7 uh, composed around 7th century ad it is a text written by hemachandra he is a prominent digambara scholar it focused on jain yoga yogic practices and ethics apart from that there are several uh, commentaries are there purvas are there these are ancient jain texts believed to be lost but referred to in later works so this is about the jain uh, literature apart from that there are epic narratives are, are also there like adi purana and trishasti lakshana mahavira purana they narrate the lives of the tirthankaras and jain mythology also right so this is about the <coughs> religious literature all together right now we will see the secular literature many secular literature are there like the <coughs> if you see in ancient india dharma sutras are there right so these are the legal texts though often classified under smriti right so they are considered somewhat secular because uh, because they focused on practical knowledge apart from that you have arthashastra very very important book one of the foremost books which have written on state craft and other things right it has many subjects like economics politics military strategy etc etc so the author famous author you know about him very well chanakya or vishnugupta <coughs> he is known as uh, that is written by him right so apart from that many other secular texts are also there like uh, if you see the kalidasa famous writer kalidas he has written very very important plays like raghuvamsha raghuvamshan malavika agni mitram vikram overvashi so many plays and the dramas he has written apart from that other writers are also there many other writers are also there banabatta banabatta is there uh right many other others are there you try to know about those others and the individual books written by them so all these things will come under the secular literature so medieval india apart from the books uh, books that have been written in the delhi sultanate period many uh, books have been written during this period and also mughal period also written especially if you see the kalhana raja tarangini kashmiri he is the kalhana belongs to kashmir so he has written the chronology of the kings that <coughs> who have ruled the uh, kashmir so beautifully it is beautifully explained it is considered as one of the foremost historical documents in india kalhana raja tarangini all right next bilhana is also there he has also continued where kalhana has left he has continued the history of Kash- kashmir right <coughs> apart from that you will see plenty of books being written uh, during the uh, in the regional kingdoms like vijayanagara empire is there like bahani bahmani kingdoms are also there etc etc many kingdoms are there so in re- regional languages like telugu kannada tamil plenty of literature has been created especially when you see the vijayanagara empire so there is a concept called ashta ashta digajas ashta digajas so there was a question few years back in the mains about the literature during the vijayanagara empire so there are astadigajas means which literally mean eight elephants so eight famous poets were there at the court of uh, vijayanagara famous uh, vijayanagara ruler sri krishna devaraya so he himself was a great 
uh, not only he he was a great patron of literature but he himself was a great uh, poet he has composed amukta malyada amukta malyada which is considered as a one of the greatest prabandhas one of the great is considered as one of the greatest pra- prabandhas amukta malyada uh, you know concept of kavya and prabandha is there there is a uh, there is a comprehensive difference between kavyas and prabandhas uh, somewhere try to know uh, the difference between kavya and prabandha also so somewhat prabandhas are very very vast books when compared to kavyas kavyas are translations mostly these are translations but however prabandhas are considered as original text some slight a slight story will be taken from the puranas so just just now we have discussed the, the concept of puranas so a story line will be taken from puranas and it will be uh, improved into a very big story in uh, prabandhas apart from that if you see the use of matrix if you see see the description of nature at the various uh, we can say various types of descriptions will be there huge amount of matrix will be used in uh, prabandhas uh, if you see uh, and also the rasas navarasas in navarasas uh, in prabandha the uh, romantic rasa that is uh, known as shringara rasa that is given the primary role in the prabandhas if you see the kavyas here the bhakti bhakti or dharmaviram that is given dharmavira rasa that is given the major importance so like that there are major differences between the uh, kavyas and the prabandhas you try to know the difference between them also so kavyas mainly they promote bhakti viras prabandhas give importance to shringara rasa so there is equal importance to the narration of the story and the matrix used in the kala in the kavyas but here the narration of the story is completely dominated by the importance given to the poet uh, the importance given to the matrix that are used so those these are the simple differences between the kavyas and the prabandhas try to know that those differences also right so this is about the uh, vernacular li- literature in kannada in tamil in telugu huge amount of uh, literature has been created produced right so apart from that you should be uh, knowing the guptan literature also huge amount of literature has been created during the guptan time especially chandragupta to so uh, just like the uh, vijayanagara empire there is a concept of ashtadigajas uh, uh, during the chandragupta period chandragupta 2 period there is a concept of navaratnas navaratnas so nine gems so nine important poets have been attributed to the during the period of during the rule of uh, during the reign of chandragupta 2 even kalidasa has been put under one gem in the uh, one ratna in the navaratnas so try to know the who are the navaratnas and what are the books written or books composed by them right so this is the this is about the secular literature right so now we will see the scientific literature so uh, within the secular literature we can uh, we can consider the scientific literature a part of the secular literature itself however right we try to see the uh, various ty- various sec- uh, scientific literature that has been created in the ancient and medieval period also right so the vedas itself themselves provide just like i have given the example of suluva sutra suluva sutra so it has uh, it contain lot of uh, information that we can put it in the put it in the geometry like it has discussed various shapes and sizes and also the well known or you can say the pythagoras theorem pythagoras theorem is also discussed in the sulva sutra right next uh, jyotisha vedanta is also there it has lo- discussed a lot about the uh, astronomy etc all the subjects are discussed in that next there is a book called surya siddhanta composed uh, around 4th century ad so it is a influential influential astronomical text by aryabhatta so this book has also been uh, written leelavati it is written by baskaraachari leelavati uh, is the one part in a broader book written by baskaraacharya right 
So in this, he explored various mathematical concepts, including algebra, arithmetic, geometry, trigonometry. Right. <coughs> right. Next, there is uh, Sushruta Samhita. It is a book on surgery. So uh, Sushruta, the great surgeon at that uh, of that time, he has composed this book, Sushruta. Next, Charaka Samhita is there. It is a great book on great great book on medicine, various medicinal practices. and it is the corner zone of Ay ayurveda and it is composed by charaka the great uh, uh, medical practitioner at that time charaka so apart from that there is a books uh, and developments in chemistry also chemistry and meta metallurgy there is a book called rasa rasa shastra it is composed between 10 and 12th century ad and uh, apart from that uh, engineering and technology so the artha shastra is com uh, comprising many subjects related to mining irrigation systems town planning etc many things are there so apart from that patanjali patanjali yoga shastra many books are there plenty of books are there uh, individual it is very it is here impossible to discuss the individual uh, composers and their respective books right uh, next uh, this is about the i mean scientific books scientific literature next we will see the sangam literature so sangam literature is composed between 3rd century bc to 3rd century ad so uh, if you see uh, classification if we uh, see the sangam literature majorly it is related to it is composed by uh, the Tal tamil bhakti saints tamil bhakti saints majorly it is composed but apart from bhakti it has various subjects it throws light on various subjects like polity sangam time polity society society and religion and uh, economy economy all these things the sangam literature throws light on we all these various aspects so majorly we can divide the sangam literature into two major categories that is akam uh, it is literally meaning in a, it focuses on emotions and feelings related to love domestic life separation and social practices next category that is puram it is outer literally means outer it deals with heroism warfare kinship ethics and public life right so it celebrates the bravery of warriors and the virtue virtues of kings and the importance of adhering to moral codes right so these are the two major categories and there are seven sub categories are also there i mean the entire sangam literature it has been categorized into seven sub categories based on what based on uh, the geographical setting uh, that is there in the those books and the emotions associated with it so based on these characteristic features they have been further sub sub categorized into seven uh, seven right so they are known as tinai those categories are kurinchi so basically these are tamil words it is very difficult to pronounce them properly so uh, i'm sorry if i pronounce them wrongly but i'll try to pronounce them anyhow anyway so first category is kurinchi that is also known as mountain next category is mullai pastoral uh, marudam it is arable neidal it is coastal palai uh, english translation is arid why vagai it is wayside nadan it is urban so these are the seven categories further sub categories so there are if you see the examples major examples from the sangam literature uh, first example is eight anthologies that is also known as ettutokai so it is a collection of eight anthologies containing poems on various themes including love war and social life right so if we see include i mean further if we see notable anthologies in that nariyani akananuru koruntokai these are the further anthologies notable anthologies in ettutto ettutokai next there are pattu pattu that is there are they are known as 10 idyls uh, these are a collection of 10 long poems each focusing on a specific theme such as love war and social satire 
so in that paripadal it is a noteworthy example right so this is the sangam literature so apart from that when you study about the mains so you will study what are the political aspects what are the social aspects what are the economic aspects what are the religious aspects that are there in the sangam literature you will clearly study when you study this mains related aspects next are foreign accounts uh, we can also call them as the accounts of the travelers so some famous travelers have come to india and they have left valuable information about the indian history whenever we lack we are lacking the uh, local sources right so examples are uh, megasthenes best example is megasthenes he was the greek uh, ambassador into the court of chandragupta maurya cgm he was ambassador to the court of chandragupta maurya and he left a uh, very valuable book that is uh, generally known as indica name with the name of indica so he was an ambassador to mauryan court he was a greek um, greek ambassador his account offers various insights into administration especially the mauryan administration society economy and the mauryan empire so this book uh, in his book he said that india uh, i mean there is no he mentioned that there is no slavery in india but uh, if we compare the slavery style of slavery in greece uh, we have a very liberal form of, form of slavery in india that's why megasthenes is confused that there is no slavery at all in india so these kind these kind of things are there if when you study uh, in mains you will uh, in detail study about these books so however the uh, the book of megasthenes that is indica that is very very important so apart from that we have fahian who visited during the 5th century ad uh, it is uh, it is told that he uh, fam- i mean he visited during the reign of uh, chandragupta 2 he visited during the reign of chandragupta 2 so we have come to the uh, greatness come to know about the greatness of chandragupta 2 because of the writings of fahian only so he came to india he was very keenly interested in buddhism and he learned buddhism right so uh, in that process he also left way valuable information through his various writings right so that is about the fahian next uh, huyan sang he also vi- visited uh, during the 7th century right he visited during the 7th century right so he also left uh, these are uh, he they become converted to buddhism and these buddhist monks documented their travels throughout india recording observations about religious practices social life and the political conditions also apart from that we also have arab and uh, persian accounts so in that very most important one is al biruni so he came to india during the 11th century so mostly he is associated with the attacks of the ghazni muhammad of ghazni ghazni so he along he came along with ghazni so once he came to india he left ghazni so ghazni was uh, doing his uh, activity that is raiding indian kingdoms so alberuni started observing keenly started keenly observing indian culture indian philosophy and sciences he was a great polymath at that time he spent years studying all these uh, all these aspects in india so his writing all writings are also have also offered a detailed insightful account of 11th century india so actually this albenis account it has known as the mirror of 11th century india mirror of 11th century india because of the great insights given by his book at that time so apart from that there is one more traveler a moroccan traveler uh, visited india uh, in uh, 14th century because uh, not only he visited india his travel constitutes a great uh, i mean he traveled a vast area of country sorry vast a- area of world so we can say it is a, he is a great traveler uh, at that time in the 14th century he traveled that much uh, i mean that much part of the world so, so we can say it's, it's a great feat so not only he visited india he served in the delhi sultanate he served in various uh, king king under various sultans of 
Delhi Sultanate, including Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he served uh, in the court of Muhammad bin uh, Tughlaq also. So uh, actually, the various as aspects or experiments that have been done by Muhammad bin Tughlaq, like uh, introducing the token currency, shifting the capital from Devgiri, uh, sorry, Delhi to Devgiri, or the additional taxes imposed by Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Uh, in the Ganga Yamuna Doha. So all these accounts, lot of criticism about these initiatives will get from the it, Ibn Battuta's account only. So actually he favored some other sultans uh, over Ibn Battuta. He severely criticized Muhammad bin Tughlaq in his writing because uh, he was a great officer. Uh, I mean, he served under various sultans. So various other sultans uh, treated him well. But he fell apart with Muhammad bin Tughlaq and for some period of time, Muhammad bin Tughlaq also imprisoned uh, Ibn Battuta. So because of that grudge only, so lot of criticism we see in the Ibn Battuta's writing. So however, it uh, offers uh, some insights into 14th century India. So after that, he was released from the jail and his position has been restored and after that he left India. So once he reached Morocco, his native place, his home place, he composed all these books. He has started writing his experiences. He put his writings, uh, he, he put his uh, experience, experiences into writing. So this is the, uh, this is about literature, right? So we will see now a question related to a literature. The question is, which one of the follow, following statement about Sangam literature in ancient South India is correct? So question is asked in 2023. Question is, right. So Sangam poems devoid of any reference to material culture. This is an incorrect statement. They have references, huge references to material culture also. Like polity, how the way of life, what are the people's practices how agriculture is being practiced, etc, etc. There are many descriptions in the Sangam literature poems. Option B, the social classification of Varna was known to Sangam poets. Yes, this is correct. Uh, the Varna system that is prominent in North India uh, at that time, but this was known to Sangam poets. This is the correct statement. Next statement is, Sangam poems have no reference of war ethic. This is incorrect statement. Major portion of Sangam literature is dedicated to war ethic only, warrior ethic only. Next is Sangam literature refers to a magical forces, uh, refers to magical forces as irrational. This is also an incorrect statement. They believe, the Sangam text believe in magical forces. They do not declare them as irrational. So this statement is also incorrect. So correct statement is B, option B. Right. So this is one question that is asked based on the literature. Many other questions are also there. So if you go through the previous uh, yes questions, you will come to know about them. Right. So this is it for today. Thank you. Thank you for joining the class. Uh, see you next time. Until then, have a good day. Let's see you next time.